Hi, Michael. Can you hear me okay? I can. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. <laughs> Just want to make sure everything's working. Yeah. Want to give me a quick pronunciation? <laughs> yeah, it's Svoboda. Svoboda. Perfect. That's what I asked my wife last night, and she was like, it's so obviously clear from her email. How do you not get this? And I was like, I don't know. I'm, I'm bad at things. <laughs> no, I'm really bad at pronunciation. As it is, I'm like, there's probably names in my paper that I'm like, ooh, I'm not sure how to pronounce those. <laughs> um, I know we have <laughs> only uh, two minutes till we're technically supposed to start. We'll probably give people some more time to get into the room. Um, the way I was going to approach this was introduce the panel, um, uh, the panelists, just your names, and then do your individual introductions before each one of your papers. Um, and then a minute or two between papers just to catch our breaths and um, get set up for screen share if we have any um, PowerPoints or slides or anything. And then just um, hold all questions till the end. Um, unless someone has any complaints, objections, any other ideas, um, a pretty standard approach, I would say. That sounds That's perfect. perfect. Yeah. yeah. And right. Mike, Mike, thank you for that email about our Zoom room. I was worried for this. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just the, the one of the, the things of doing the online one. I worked on one at Penn State, but I was not, I was not nearly as involved as like Amy and the rest of the crew there. But remembering like, you have to have a host and a panel and a chair and it's just <laughs> so many moving pieces so mm -hmm. and i should say kelly i also i have a post-it with pronunciations um i just need to remember to look at the post-it when i'm trying to talk and also notice my slides on my paper but it helps to know yeah, like there. like i referenced this back by uh it's edited by susan bloom or blum i'm like i don't know how to pronounce it honestly it, it's blum i thought it might be blum but i'm like i also know someone who had that last name and pronounced it bloom see i probably would have said up. bloom <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i think i would have too i only know because I, I i i'm pretty sure i was assigned that book <laughs> to read at one point and the professor knew her so Hi. yeah Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um Speaking of pronunciation, I did want to just real quickly, I'm assuming Alice Keen, Emily Hinoff, and then Kelly Svoboda. Yep. Sounds good. And then Emily, for you, just real quick, um, I was looking this up last night. Hannah Hosh or Hesh? It's Hook. Hook. Okay. Hook. Yeah. Of course, I had it exactly wrong. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but, oh, great. Yes. And then, um, Alice, I will copy this link. Uh, and, and I will put it in the chat. Um, I just try, like assuming Murphy's Law would be happening, I just tried a test share of a link in the chat, and I think it's actually working, which shocks me, but it is. It seems to I, be. It, it worked on, on my computer. Awesome. Um, I'm going to so also put mine in. Yeah, I'm doing that now too. It's a PDF, so it's taking a Great. little bit of time to load up. No worries. And then, yeah, I will. Um, copy and paste these links that way I can uh, I can put them in the chat um, as more people filter in um, because I think if you enter the room after uh, a chat it won't show up for you okay at least that seems to have been the case um, in previous sessions no I've taught on zoom enough to know that that is definitely true <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah, I, I was on Zoom for, I guess, two years. Now I'm on Blackboard, and it's it's rough. <laughs> I, I use Blackboard for everything except the synchronous class meetings. We use Zoom separately for that, for exactly this reason. 
I, I ended up doing that with, with my um, lit courses because they were mostly upper level and, and majors and older students. But for my intro to comp, it just, I don't know if they were messing with me. There was some disconnect. So we're just like, we have to use Blackboard because students couldn't figure out Zoom. Huh. Also, Canvas is just way better than Blackboard. Gotta be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used Get Blackboard for years and years and years, but yeah, then we switched to Canvas and it was a transition, but it does work better, I find. Yeah, I, I miss it. <laughs> I did the opposite. I was on Canvas I guess, for five or six years and now I've been relegated to Blackboard. So. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting to hear these endorsements of Canvas. I, I've never used it, um, <clears throat> but I know when we were going online for the pandemic, the idea was everyone would use Blackboard for the class meetings, Blackboard Ultra. And mm -hmm. a lot of faculty were buying their own, you know, subscribing to Zoom on their own and kind of uh, using personal Zoom rooms for class meetings. So my, my uh, university got a license. But I think Canvas, if you don't need to, if you can use Canvas for both aspects, the course shell and the meetings, that sounds better. Mm -hmm. So I'll give um, people another minute or two just um, in case they're running late from their break or whatnot. Uh, it seems, at least for me, it seems like just about every panel started about five minutes after time and they've still had plenty um, of time for everyone to give their presentations in full and then um, have a, a fairly robust Q&A afterwards. So I think, I think we'll be okay. Um, like the, the only way I could imagine me saying like, hey, uh, check your time as if you're going over like 30 minutes, but I, I'm assuming no one, no one here is, you know, um, we've done this before. <laughs> we know the game. Um, uh, so we should be good. Uh, yeah, we still have a few more people filtering in and getting them in from the waiting room. Um, yeah, we'll do, we'll just wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Um, Am I right that past Wolf conferences have often had the 75 rather than 90 minutes? Because I am noticing discussions really are in depth and they don't feel like, you know, we're running out of time in the same way that years past pre pandemic, it had sometimes, sometimes felt mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. four and a half seems great for panels and QA. Yeah, so this is actually my first Wolf conference um, because on my my university when I was doing my graduate work, you only really got money for one conference a year, um, and so it was MSA for my first four years and the MLA for the last ones just to do the job stuff. Um, so I'm very happy to finally <laughs> get to join because I love Wolf. I mean, she's basically the last two chapters of my district, or I guess it's now called a book project, but. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, You're welcome. And thank you also for that wonderful paper about, you know, the detestable Cambridge, Wolf mm -hmm. and Cambridge and pedagogy. And, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for this, uh, for this panel, just because um, I've definitely shifted my, my thinking um, to be my scholarly thinking to be more about pedagogies. So I'm, I'm super thrilled to hear everybody's papers. Um, and on that note, I guess it'd be a, a good time to start. We have one more person. I'll let them in. Um, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, this Friday evening panel on Pedagogies of Resistance, Pedagogies of Response. Um, my name is Michael Hartz. I'm serving as panel chair, and we have three Wonderful panelists here to share some of their work with us, um, Alice Keen, Emily Hinoff, and Kelly Svoboda. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them individually before their talks. They will give their talk. We'll wait a minute or two in between talks for everyone to catch their breath, get things set up on the Zoom room. And then we'll have um, uh, the last part of the meeting for our Q&A. Uh, we've been doing this for a few days now, so I'm sure everyone's well aware, but feel free to put questions you have as they come up in the comments. We have a chat moderator who will um, manage that for us, uh, but you can also feel free to hold them until the very end, okay? Um, so with that in mind, uh, uh, 
again, look very much looking forward to this panel. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly provocative and quite generative for a lot of us, um, especially in the ways we think about teaching and teaching Wolf and modernism. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to go in program order. So first, we have Alice D. Keene, who earned her PhD in English Language and Literature from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Since 2015, she has been an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of English at Queens College City University of New York. Her publications include Miserably Devaluated Currency, Language, Economy, and Fascism, and Christopher Isherwood's The Berlin Stories in Virginia Woolf's The Years, which was published in the Virginia Woolf Miscellany, and Love, Trauma, and Memory in recent Toni Morrison scholarship published in Orbit, a journal of American literature. Alice, floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. And first, let me try sharing my screen. Um, an access copy of my presentation is in the chat as well for anyone um, who would like to um, not deal with screen share. Um, should be working. Um, Um, so, um, my presentation, um, I should probably mention, uh, picks up in certain ways with that very, um, generative Q&A about text pairings, um, in, um, Gretchen Holbrook-Grazina's wonderful, uh, keynote talk, uh, this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> but for context, uh, emphasizing the too often ignored influence um, of empire and slavery in early modern texts. Uh, Kimberly Ann uh, Coles, Kim Hall, and Ayanna Thompson presented the MLA in 2019 with a call for action, demonstrating um, what they described as an ethical imperative to equip our students to understand and engage critically with the world as it is, not as it was imagined by the University of Chicago's Great Books Program of the 1940s. Um, Here's what they asked, and in asking, they forecasted benefit not only to students, but to their subfields. Quote, we have to self-consciously, deliberately, and carefully unravel how these texts do their work and how we do the work of their transmission. This will reinvigorate our fields intellectually at the same time that it will make them more attractive to the changing student body that we teach. Such an ethical imperative, as well as the benefit of better engaging 21st century students' interests, also extends to our teaching of modernist texts, given their fraught engagement with race and empire. And modernist scholars, especially in the past decade, have begun this pedagogical work. Today, I'd like to explore one approach in particular, how an intersectional lens drawing upon the concept of restoring has the potential to open up new perspectives on Bloomsbury's modernism in the 21st century classroom. For example, in Zadie Smith's On Beauty, published in 2005, which restores E.M. Forster's Howard's End, and in Asali Solomon's The Days of Aphrodite, published last October, which combines influences from Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde to restore Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. 21st century Black women writers engage with and deliberately vary Bloomsbury fictional precedents. Um, Wolf scholar Kristen Zarnicki has suggested that transatlantic comparisons between Bloomsbury's modernism and the modernism of the Harlem Renaissance may help literary scholars better understand how to quote, um, how quote, Bloomsbury and Harlem might be brought closer together in our minds, our scholarships, and our classrooms. Building on Sarnicki's comparative ideas, I think a cross-generational approach that draws upon the recent work of Black women writers who engage with Bloomsbury also has significant potential to offer new pedagogical perspectives on Bloomsbury's modernism. Here, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas's concept of restoring, uh, which she develops in The Dark Fantastic, is particularly illuminating. For Thomas, restoring is a kind of critical counter-storytelling that restores interpretive agency for readers of color who have been excluded from canonical texts, enabling them to quote, reimagine the very stories themselves. Although Thomas's 2019 monograph focuses on YA speculative fiction, 
she extends the concept of restoring across genres and audiences to encompass, for example, Lynn manuel Miranda's Broadway musical Hamilton. Thomas's concept of restoring also builds upon Toni Morrison's theoretical work in Playing in the Dark. Uh, which we learned this afternoon, also encompasses Dr. Grazina's theoretical work, to quote, privilege the fictional imagined Africanist others who have been consistently elided in narrative representation by Western and particularly United States authors. Consonant with restoring, Felicia Rose Chavez in the anti-racist writing workshop, How to Decolonize the Creative Classroom, speaks in favor of completing the canon as opposed to outright rejecting, replacing, or deconstructing the canon. Her rationale for continuing to study and teach these works is that canonical Western literature offers invaluable insight into imperialist white supremacist ideology. Chavez suggests pairing a classic canonical text in conversation with a historical or contemporary text by a writer of color. As she explains, this side-by-side -side study acknowledges a call and response, both are political texts in need of unpacking. A kind of pairing that specifically uses restoring foregrounds for students gaps in the earlier narratives, illuminating even more clearly by contrast aspects of intersectionality in the more contemporary ones. We can see how this works, for example, in Zadie Smith's restoring of Howard's End. It's important to keep in mind in setting up this comparison that on the one hand, E.M. Forster and also Virginia Woolf moved toward increasing and culturally resonant public engagement. During the economic and political crises of the 1930s and the increasingly foreseeable onset of the Second World War. However, as Dr. Gazina has observed, quote, it is impossible to discuss their attitudes toward empire without acknowledging the role that race and class play in empire and imperialism. Um, that's from her Bloomsbury and Empire. Uh, and as she reminded us this afternoon, Wolf and her fellow Bloomsbury artist, Duncan Grant, first came to public attention through the medium of Empire in 1910 when they swooped the British Navy in the Dreadnought hoax. These discordant notes are most striking during the old Bloomsbury hour before World War I. They lessen, but only to a partial extent, by the 1930s. When we pair novels by Forster and Smith, we can interrogate how Forster does to some degree rupture in Wardian era fictional norms at the conclusion of Howard's End. He unsettles readers' expectations with new patterns of family and inheritance, but especially with the incongruous death of Leonard Bast, literally crushed by the cultural and class machinery that his ambition and idealism cannot overcome, Leonard collapsed, expires under the unsubtle weight of the books that Forster and his Bloomsbury cohort will continue to create. But all of Forster's characters are white and most of them are privileged enough to be fixated on a question of inheritance, which Forster himself acknowledged as a metaphor for who shall inherit England. Zadie Smith, as she revisits and revises the tropes of Howard's End almost a century later, rewrites the fictional script. In Smith's third novel on beauty, Howard Bilsey's son, Levi Bridges class and race, surviving his own approach to the libraries of his era, which in his case store not print, but music. Smith's own reflections as a writer on Wolf and Forster are extensive. She characterizes Forster as, quote, an Edwardian among modernists, and yet in matters of pacifism, class, education, and race, a progressive among conservatives. She suggests an implicit parallel between Forster's round, complex Edwardian characters and Wolf's later call for writers to experiment with free and direct discourse as they represent the psychological complexity and individuality of characters in modern fiction. As Smith writes, quote, Forster is of the first literary generation to inherit the idea that our very consciousnesses are at root faulty and fearful, uncertain and mysterious. Of Wolf, she offers a complex perspective um, this is in her essay collection, Changing My Mind, quote, as a reader, I want to claim Wolf my sister, but she also acknowledges a sense of distancing from what she calls Wolf's entitlement. Primarily, but not entirely centering Black characters, Smith's On Beauty critiques and repairs significant and too often characteristic aesthetic appropriations and omissions of canonical modernism in both literature and the visual arts. 
So for example, students can see from this pairing and restoring how, as Regina Martin observes, Smith's protagonist, Kiki Bilsey's quote, personhood, her personality, sense of self, and even her own desires. And I apologize if anyone can hear the sirens heading down the street, the city. Um, <clears throat> Her personality, sense of self, and even her own desires is defined by her body and appearance in ways she cannot control, and in ways that are informed by an intersection of social positionalities, including femininity, race, size, age, and nationality. Kiki's white husband, Howard Belsey, an art historian in Cambridge, Massachusetts professor, imagines Pablo Picasso's water carriers when he looks at his black wife, reenacting the appropriations of early 20th century visual artists, including Bloomsbury's post-impressionists. Ultimately, Azulka Anjaria notes of on beauty, quote, blackness, fatness, middle age, and all sorts of non-canonical post-colonial beauty function in the novel in relative autonomy in an alternative world engendered by the radical decolonization of the aesthetic canon. Another example of restoring pairs novels by Virginia Woolf and Asali Solomon. In Woolf's later novels, the figurative bookshelves that crush Forster's Leonard Bast continue to fall on fictional displaced servants like Crosby, who the charitable elder partridge daughter Eleanor likens to a dog in the years, even as the living sketch workers in Woolf's diaries of the 1930s throw harsh light upon the realities of economic violence that underlie, sustain, and to some degree must call into question the ultimate scope of Bloomsbury's intellectual and cultural work, and certainly the historically and culturally immediate cost of such work to others in their own time. In the days of Aphrodite, Solomon restores Mrs. Dalloway foregrounding Black women's experiences in different neighborhoods of 21st century Philadelphia. Solomon's characters occupy disparate class positions, navigating economic and professional privilege or its lack, and also for protagonist Lucille Belmont's former lover, Selena Octave, whose character conflates aspects of both Sally Seaton and Septima Smith and Mrs. Dalloway, psychological precarity. Like Smith's Kiki Belsey, Solomon's Lucille confronts racist and classist expectations of beauty. She supervises preparations for an elaborate dinner party for donors on the eve of her white husband Wynne's electoral defeat and pending indictment, even as she feels uncomfortable with her housekeeper's PhD candidate and immigration rights activist's daughter's temporary role as the help. Misnamed routinely Lisa, Lisa, Lizette, even Lysol, Lizelle confronts key questions about identity, love, and authenticity after her mother Verity asks, Quote, you want to know if you should throw a party to thank these people who had nothing better to do with their money and time than to help you delude yourselves? Like Clarissa Dalloway, Lucille Belmont wonders about and responds to the complexity, the imagined inner lives of the people she sees, even strangers. For example, quote, the sight of every unhoused, insane, uncared for Black woman chipped away at her. She both wanted to know and didn't want to know how each one got there. She found herself looking in their faces for Selena. At first, she dismisses Wynne's Aunt Gladys, but then she revisits that assumption, recognizing that Gladys's agency might have been limited, despite her class and racial privilege, in the context of Wynne's awful patriarchal family. Here, Solomon's glancing reference to Virginia Woolf is no accident. Quote, I'm glad you like it, Gladys, said Lizelle. She tried not to look at the woman's claw, its startling bluish veins, but then her face, its Virginia Woolf hollow, struck Lizelle as poignant, though it was emotionally wasteful to feel sorry for rich white women. They made their choices, or did they? Lizelle and Selena both want to become writers when they are lovers in college, but neither does, at least within the scope of the novel's timeline. As Lizelle reflects, on her own literary prospects, comparing different neighborhoods of Philadelphia and the relative intersectional privilege and risk of those who live in them, she thinks, quote, she had a better chance of being a writer in the Harlem Renaissance. Meanwhile, Selena, estranged from Lizelle after graduation, is trapped by economic precarity. 
Solomon represents Selena Octave as a character who experiences a psychological condition very like Septimus Smith's shell shock in Mrs. Dalloway. But for Selena, it's triggered by the repeated intersectional violence of her own kind. Barely hanging on, Selena in this scene thinks about the racist destruction of Moose Compound in 1985 in Philadelphia, where dropping two bombs from a helicopter Police killed 11 people, including five children in a black neighborhood. Here, suicidal, Selena uses writing to try to process that history, addressing her note to 13 year old Bertie Africa, who was the only child to survive the new bombings. Dissatisfied, Selena kept writing her drafts in a notebook with a purple floral pattern. Why? Here in West Philadelphia, there had been the Moose Fire. Of course, she could not leave anything to the children who died then choking on smoke as they cried out for parents who roasted alongside them had they held each other had they held one another at the end she would address her note to Bertie Africa you have seen she wrote the true face of the world uh transmuting Forster's questions of inheritance in an entirely different way both Mrs. Dalloway and the days of Afrikiti represent one day in the life of an economically privileged woman both of each of these protagonists is paired with another character uh, who much more visibly experiences precarity. But here the novels diverge in a significant way. Septimus Smith, whose mind echoes Clarissa's in uncanny ways, although they never meet, without her class status or economic resources, traumatized by war, doesn't survive. Selena, on the other hand, as Solomon's novel closes, is on her way to reconnect with herself. Thinking back to their shared chosen symbolic word from Audre Lorde, Afrikiti, now knowing that she and Lizelle had the agency to take Lorde as a model, perhaps in both living and in writing, as Wynne's house is about to be disrupted. Did you say Man Airy? asked Selena. She thought of the notepad at her mother's house, Afrikiti. That's what she herself should have said when she called Lizelle's house the last time, when she was falling into a hole, Afrikiti. And she concludes, I'll go up there with you to Manary. There is somebody. We can see how, as Solomon and Smith innovate upon and reimagine the fictions of their modernist predecessors while centering Black characters, they interrogate, disrupt, and repair the aphorias of Bloomsbury's canonical narratives. Their projects have significant ethical stakes. Matthew Celesi's citing Morrison's playing in the dark in his recent book, Craft in the Real World, Rethinking fiction writing and workshopping has noted, quote, craft says something about who deserves their story told, who has agency and who does not, what is worthy of action and what description, whose bodies are on display, who changes and who stays the same, who controls time, whose world it is, who holds meaning and who gives it. The ethical stakes go beyond the text and beyond the classroom. As Celeste also notes, craft reflects culture and can develop to resist and reshape culture if it is sufficiently examined and enough work is done to unmake expectations and replace them with new ones. As he notes, craft is inseparable from identity. Craft does not exist outside of society, outside of culture, outside of power. In the world we live in and write in, craft must reckon with the implications of our expectations for what story should be. In their restoring, Smith and Solomon remake craft and decolonize modernist culture and our own. Decolonizing the modernist curriculum is not only about including previously marginalized voices, it is about relearning how to read canonical texts using an intersectional lens, which restores agency and power also to students who have been excluded by traditional canons. We could consider additional examples of restoring for instance, Natasha Brown's debut novel, Assembly, which also restores Mrs. Dalloway, or many potential pairings of novels by Virginia Woolf and Toni Morrison. But in the interest of time, I'd like to mention only one more, which illustrates a broader scope for this approach by crossing genres. Both Smith and Solomon set their novels in the world of higher education. Cambridge, Massachusetts for Zadie Smith, who like so much of Bloomsbury attended the other Cambridge, and Bryn Moore for Solomon. In Kay Wilson's Of One Woman or So, an anagram for Wolf's title, 
a room of one's own gets a hands-on revision and Bloomsbury's Cambridge gets a direct critique. Here, we see a multimedia artist restoring not fiction, but Wolf's feminist economic polemic. Wilson using digital technology rearranged, um, and as Dr. Christina also told us, so I'll summarize this quickly, um, but rearranged every word of a room of one's own and then created a visual artwork uh, with each word individually cut out of Wolf's text and then stuck together in the new order. His punctuation and formatting changes were added in pen on top of Wolf's words to show how the two artists collaborated across time. Uh, Wilson's narrator, Olivia McGaufrey, an anagram of Wolf's name, is a young African woman of mixed race who is radicalized by the elitism and Eurocentrism of her contemporary Cambridge. She considers, as Wolf did, burning down its libraries and with them its exclusionary ideas and pedagogy, but instead resolves to recycle Wolf's text, making it her own story. As Wilson describes the work on his website, his novella, quote, playfully celebrates Wolf's canonical work by bringing contemporary critiques to bear upon it. This element of playfulness is important as we consider ways to make modernist texts more attractive to 21st century students, critical yet playful engagement with earlier works um, becomes quite different from a top-down mandatory distribution uh, requirement for English majors, you must read Shakespeare or you must read Wolf. As Kim Hall has said about her own field of early modernism in a conversation with the Folger Shakespeare Library, quote, I don't think people are told specifically, you're not allowed to interpret Shakespeare, but I think there are kind of subtle messages, quote, Shakespeare is not for you or Shakespeare is not. And here she uses ellipses before continuing, quote, that kind of excludes Shakespeare from your cultural heritage. We all know that the most effective pedagogy is inclusive. It creates an environment where all students feel, wel feel welcome. And as Gloria Anzaldúa explains in Speaking in Tongues, quote, uh, and we see it happening in these restorings, quote, I write to record what others erase when I speak, to rewrite the stories others have miswritten about me, about you. Contemporary writers work on doing the erasures, restoring the miswritings of canonical narratives paired with those earlier texts in the classroom has the potential to facilitate not only an important sense of belonging, but also to facilitate greater engagement and learning, empowering all students to share their knowledge and experience. Thank you. I give you the, the Zoom claps, the, <laughs> the light finger taps. Um, so, our next presenter is Emily Hanoff. She posted uh, a file um, of her presentation earlier. Uh, if you were not able to grab that file, I'm going to upload it right now. And then hopefully you will be able to download it. It's um, It took a little bit for me, maybe a minute or so. So when it, once it gets loaded, Great. So yeah, the file is now in the chat. All you have to do is click on it. It should download and then click on it again and it should open um, and whatever your computer uses to open PDFs. But while, while we'll give, I'll, I'll just introduce Emily now. That way you can um, download that during, um, uh, during uh, her introduction. All right. So <clears throat> Emily M. Hinoff is an English professor and program coordinator at Great Bay Community College in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where she teaches college writing, women's literature, film studies, an internship in the humanities, and British literature from Beowulf to Virginia Woolf. She has published, sorry, she has published on Wolf, Catherine Mansfield, Zora Neale Hurston, Sylvia Townsend Warner, Tina Madodi, and Robert Louis Stevenson, among others. Her essay, Teaching the Harlem Renaissance, Hannah Hawk, Marita O. Bonner, and Nella Larson, appeared in the, in the volume Teaching Modernist Women's Writing in English, which was edited by Janine M. Utel for the MLA Options for Teaching series in 2021. More recently, she presided over a remote panel she organized for the International Virginia Woolf Society titled 
Wolf's 21st Century Academia um, at the 2022 MLA Annual Convention. So let's turn it over to Emily. Thank you, Mike. All right, so my title is Thinking Peace into Existence, Teaching the World War II Era Work of Virginia Woolf, Jessica Dismore, and Elizabeth Bowen. Expressing the shattering effect of World War I on the consciousness of all communities, Woolf warns, quote, we are sharply cut off from our predecessors, a shift in the scale, the war, a sudden slip of masses held in position for ages has shaken the fabric from top to bottom, alienated us from the past and made us perhaps too vividly conscious of the present. Wolf's view of history as shaken fabric, utterly disrupted, displaced, overcome by violence, shows us that the First World War had blinded her contemporary society to anything redemptive beyond the here and now of utter destruction. The same thing could be said for the World War II era. For Wolf, and as I will argue for her contemporaries, the English painter Jessica Dismore and the Irish writer Elizabeth Bowen, art transforms our behavior in the world by reconfiguring our relations to both the artwork and its audience. Art, whether literary or visual, is a shared experience and our resonance with it reveals the possibility of positive future change so that we might think peace into existence. Today, I'll suggest an interdisciplinary approach to teaching three World War II era feminist modernist artists responses to the blast of war through, through the lenses of Wolf's essay, Thoughts on Peace in an Air Raid, published in 1940, Jessica Dismore's series of paintings from the late 1930s, related forms and superimposed forms, and Bowen's short story, Mysterious Core, published in 1945. I've used these texts alongside one another in my undergraduate British Literature II survey classroom. I teach at a community college where I don't have many English majors. And I do this in order to help students consider each of these female modernists rejection of the aggressive, patriarchal, militaristic roots of war in favor of creating alternatively nurturing communal and even utopian emblems of peace. When I introduce Wolf's essay, I want students to see how she ventures a hopeful resistance against a hegemonic history that dominates the masses, if only for fleeting moments. In Thoughts on Peace, Wolf places the blame directly on the patriarchal institutions of power. Quote, the defenders are men, the attackers are men. Arms are not given to the English woman to fight the enemy or to defend herself. She must lie weaponless tonight critiquing the cult of motherhood that happily sacrifices sons for the love of country, she notes that some would say that the maternal instinct is a woman's glory. Well, for men, that glory lies in fighting. Rather than allowing ourselves to be subsumed by patriarchal or mil maternal militarism, Wolf insists that our intellects must undo the impulse to fight. She has hope that we will overcome the nonsensical fascistic powers that be. Quote, there is another way of fighting for freedom without arms. We can fight with the mind. Mental fight means thinking against the current, not with it. She argues that our minds can create communal counter narratives, uh, thinking against the current that will free us from militaristic oppression. Furthermore, Wolf demands that we consciously eradicate any domineering fascistic hostility we harbor in our relationships with others. She pointedly asks, who is Hitler? What is he? And answers, aggressiveness, tyranny, the insane love of power made manifest. Destroy that and you will be free. Wolf speaks to the necessity to re-examine our own individual consciousness in order to make real progress in preventing war in the wider world. Quote, let us drag up into consciousness the subconscious Hitlerism that holds us down. It is the desire for aggression, the desire to dominate and enslave. She hopes that our cooperative creativity will make a positive difference. They would give them other openings for their creative power. We must create more honorable activities for those who try to conquer in themselves their fighting instinct, their subconscious Hitlerism. Wolf's collective intellectual project resists internalization of our supposed natural perception of superiority. 
The single battle Wolf affirms is the fight for common emancipation from the tyrannies of authorized history through her art. So speaking of tyrannies of authorized history, in this case, present in a work of art, here's a later painting by former vorticist William Roberts, which I often will show my students next. Jessica Dismore and Helen Saunders, the only two recognized women participants in the vorticist movement, are literally marginalized in the corner of the image. They wait on the periphery of the cafe table around which all of the prominent male vortices enjoy their repast. When the futurist C.R.W. Nevinson discussed the idea of forming the Rebel Arts Center with Wyndham Lewis, he was reputed to have said, let's not have any of those damned women. Critics of the movement went on to question whether the feminine temperament was capable of sustaining the degree of aggression necessary to create convincing vorticist works of art. Dismore was a British painter who studied at the Slade School in Paris. She met Lewis in 1913, joining the Vorticists the following year and signing their manifesto in the first issue of Blast, which students will encounter earlier in the semester. Vorticism is known for its heady mix of militarism, arrogance, bombastic slogans, and phrase making, its jagged angles, excitement, and love of speed. It has also been critiqued for its aggressive masculinist tone and its misogy misogynist rhetoric, evidenced in part by its inclusion of only two female artists whose work is still largely unknown today. Vorticism's veracity ended abruptly with the Great War, during which time Dismore served as a nurse in France, suffered and recovered from a nervous breakdown. For Alicia Foster, recovery signaled a change in Dismore's practice. After the First World War, Dismore exhibited with other ex vorticists in Group X and was also a member of the London Group and of the Seven and Five Society beginning in 1926. Dismore's rebelliousness as a feminist artist continued beyond her departure from the vorticists. Quote, the juxtaposition of the feminine and the vorticists is a means for Dismore to make visible the masculine biases inherent in the movement, according to Francesca Brooks. A great example is uh, her early work in abstract composition, which exhibits what Bridget Pepin calls subtly colored solid architectural forms that seem to float in non-gravitational space. Dismore's work became increasingly abstract, which by the mid 1930s was associated with the utopian ideals of a European avant-garde, advocating common cause and opposition to an increasingly fractious political environment on the continent. Here I highlight the series of two works entitled Related Forms that was included in the exhibition Unity of Artists for Peace, Democracy and Cultural Development in London in April and May of 1937. Dismore's deliberate move away from the phallic aggressive shapes of vorticism toward more abstract and some might say feminine forms evokes an affinity with Wolf's view of art as an organic matrixial web-like linkage between all of humanity accessible through our collective participation. And I'm thinking in particular of the line, um, the whole world is a work of art. We are, the, we are the words, we are the music, we are the thing itself from a sketch of the past. Um, um, Gabrielle McIntyre described this really beautifully in a paper that she gave this afternoon. So the peacefully rendered floating oceanic calm light blue and gray shapes and related forms in stark contrast to the harsh lines and bold colors of a typical vorticist work have curvature and subtle interrelatability that suggests collaboration. The shapes communicate the ideal of fragments that might make up a whole if only properly joined. Their suggestion as patterns for a garment further echoes Wolf's notion of shaken fabric, although here, Dismore's image presents viewers with the potential for reformation and suturing. Further in superimposed forms, the floating earth tone shapes overlap and recombine, some resembling faces looking at each other in an interconnected moment of recognition between self and other. In this space between selves, the image suggests we might find unity 
and perhaps peace will follow. Next, my students and I look to the opening image in Elizabeth Bowen's short story, Mysterious Core. As a panoptic force analogous to the searchlights on London during World War II, quote, the full moonlight drenched the city and searched it. There was not a niche left to stand in. The effect was remorseless. London looked like the moon's capital, shallow, cratered, extinct. Although the eminent threat is temporarily suspended, Londoners Papita, Arthur, and Callie are forced out of their natural rhythms by the war. Instead of keeping a stiff upper lip, as you might see in, a, in the contemporary propaganda documentary, London Can Take It, or in a war recruitment poster, both of which we also study in class. Papita's lover and soldier on leave, Arthur scoffs, well, well, join the army and see the world. Papita and Arthur escape the pressures of compulsory patriotism by imagining the ghostly lost city of Kor, a completely forsaken city that's not really anywhere, yet evokes a disenchanted world. In this alien locale, Papita expresses a nihilistic perspective. Quote, this war shows us we by no means come to the end. If you can blow whole places out of existence, you can blow whole places into it. I don't see why not. They say we can't say what's come out since the bombing started. By the time we've come to the end, Core may be the only city left, or the one city left, the abiding city. I should laugh. Bowen's characters then find new liminal spaces in the bomb city, which have been liberated in the destruction of urban architectural divisions, an in-between space that may become transformative. Papita's solace is an ideal like the walled city of Kor, representing her keen desire for escape through the paradox of security in an unfettered world in which stone walls might yet still form the protective forces they once were. This generation has been profoundly changed, destroyed by the war, which has uncovered the ingrained subconscious Hitlerism that creates strife between people. Arthur contemplates, how are any of us to know how things could have been? They forget war is not just only war. It's years out of people's lives that they've never had before and won't have again. For Arthur and Papita, Core represents a refuge from the madness of war and an existential statement on the human condition that mirrors Papita's earlier observation that the Blitz can blow whole places out of existence. Arthur yawns and tells Callie, to be humans, to be at a dead loss. The narrative closes with Papita's avid dream of transcendence in the land of Kor. Quote, Arthur had been the source, but Arthur was not the end. With him, she looked this way, that way, down the wide, void, pure streets, between the statues, pillars, and shadows, through archways and colonnades. With him, she went up the stairs down which nothing but moon came. With him, trod with the ermine dust of the endless halls, stood on the terraces, mounted the extreme tower, looked down on the statued squares, the wide, void, pure streets. He was the password, but not the answer. It was to Kor's finality that she turned. This metaphysical reckoning, Arthur's final lack of sway over Pepita, and her own urge to break free from the horrors of the Blitz, reveals a feminist resistance in the wake of another world war. Here, Bowen's narrative advocates for a place beyond constrictive standard gender conventions. Papita's ultimate desire to escape to the otherworldly core suggests a transcendence of fixed boundaries or binaries and monolithic structures. In her longing for peace, Papita's vision departs from the conventional heteronormative romance and instead becomes a quest for her own path toward a more autonomous future. Papita's final hallucinatory gesture toward peaceful re resolution resonates with Wolf's thoughts, especially in the end of Wolf's essay. When nature reemerges after the gunfire and bombs have receded, those who are free from war and tyranny can rest in the shadowed half of the world. 
Visible in each of these modernist portraits are the scars left by the World War II era conflict with fascism. Yet they also suggest new and liberating spaces unearthed by the Blitz. The smooth space of the bomb city opens up new spaces and new ways of thinking. As I discuss with my students, I'm interested in an expansive narrative of modernism that includes writers and artists who attempt to rebuild humanity's interconnections through their creative work. The works brought together here represent a certain level of optimism necessary for survival in a war-torn present, an ideology of safety that resists destruction. As in the abstract and multi-layered face-like structures carved from smooth forms that seem to beckon to one another in Dismore's superimposed forms, I find a similar pattern of hope for redemption in the conclusions of Wolf and Bowen's pieces. Dismore's abstract compositions and Wolf and Bowen's World War II era writing should also be understood in light of their political sympathies during a period labeled by W.H. Auden as a low dishonest decade, a time when modernist abstraction, international and universal in ethos was reviled by Hitler's nationalist regime. Both Wolf and Dismore died by suicide in their 50s, unable to bear the personal and global calamities of an era decimated by a second world war. Their art evokes contemplation of peace in their absence for my students and myself. These revolutionary women modernists look to a peaceful future beyond the inevitable death and turmoil of war in the present moment. Wolf, Dismore, and Bowen reveal the ethical practice of thinking peace into existence through their multivalenced works of art. Thank you. And thank you, Emily. Um, I think. We're just gonna get into the next one for the sake of time. Um, I am going to put the Google Drive link again, in case you came in late um, to our next presenters um, PowerPoint and access copy. Um, and our next presenter is Kelly Zobo. I knew it, I was, I was so thinking about not messing it up. And of course I messed it up. Kelly Svoboda is a PhD candidate at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, PA, and currently lives in Las Vegas, Nevada, where she teaches composition and literature part-time at Nevada State. Kelly is currently working with Wolf's text in two chapters of her dissertation on post-humanist effects of modernist formal strategies. Specifically, Kelly is looking at the relationship between language, silence, and action in Wolf's work as well as the ways in which dream of consciousness in Wolf's fiction works to dissolve the dichotomy of body and mind. Kelly is also engaged in consciously aligning her pedagogy with the theoretical underpinnings of her research, which is the impetus for today's presentation. Uh, oops, Kelly, it's all yours. You are still okay. Yeah, I, I, I was like, oh, I opened up my screen and then I couldn't find where to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. All right, can everybody see my screen? Okay, cool, thank you. All right, so ungrading as an adjunct, becoming Wolfian outsiders. Um, I'm gonna start with this quote aptly. <laughs> Uh, academia, and especially academic conferences, breeds insecurity and defensive posturing and showmanship in too many of us, Amy Smith. So you may or may not recognize this quote from an email that Amy sent to Wolf Conference participants um, like about a week or two ago concerning mentoring and presentations. But this point that she made really resonated with me. Uh, she was telling us to let go of these pretensions and focus instead on the conversation. Uh, imposter syndrome makes us feel like we have to overcompensate and pretend to be more certain than we are so no one will question our authority or our right to be here. Uh, while I have no desire to question anyone's intelligence, uh, I do want us all to question the specter of authority today as I'm going to work through three guineas 
to discuss how ungrading is one step toward a more Wolfian pedagogy and how Wolf's injunction to be outsiders can help us to overcome systemic barriers to implementing radical pedagogies and to sort of chip away at the hierarchical systems that make up the modern university. Um, to borrow a phrase from Michael, <laughs> I love when he said, uh, use the master's tools to renovate the house yesterday. <laughs> um, so in three guineas, Wolf discusses her vision for a new college that would replace the current model. Uh, and she says, next, what should be taught in the new college, the poor college? Not the arts of dominating other people, not the arts of ruling, of killing, of acquiring land and capital. They require too many overhead expenses, salaries, and uniforms and ceremonies. Wolf's focus on financials in this passage is something I want to touch on briefly here, and I will return to it later as well, because money basically always has strings attached. Wolf states that the quote, the giver of money is entitled to dictate terms. Um, end quote. As she's debating the terms that she would like to dictate along with her guinea, uh, which is why she's explaining this college that she's envisioning. Therefore, those with money are able to dictate what people learn, and they obviously have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo that supports their way of life. But a teacher is also often considered a giver of grades, and therefore also entitled to dictate terms, how students should write, what they should know or be interested in. It puts educators in the place of both those who dictate terms and have terms dictated for them by administrators. Um, yet it's easy for us to wanna to fight for our own academic freedom while glossing over the ways we infringe on the academic freedom and curiosity of our students through over prescriptive assignments, rubrics, and even in, especially through labeling their work with grades and I will come back to grading momentarily. First though, I'd like to draw our attention to the verbs used by Wolf here. Ruling, killing, and acquiring. They all indicate mastery over something. And mastery indicates knowingness or certainty that one has, quote, command or comprehensive knowledge of a subject, art or process, end quote. The idea that one can ever master a field of knowledge is dangerous because it ignores the fact that knowledge is constantly being maintained and created within the field's discourse communities. These verbs also are complicit in maintaining hierarchies as mastery also indicates superiority. Applied to education, this hierarchical mindset results in students who are pressured for perfection and pitted against not only one another, but also the working class who are excluded from higher education altogether. Um, so the new college, how to cultivate peace through education. Wolf's ideal college would instead teach, quote, the arts of human intercourse, the art of understanding other people's lives and minds, and the little arts of talk, of dress, of cookery that are allied with them. The aim of the new college, the cheap college, should not be to segregate and specialize, but to combine. It should explore the ways in which mind and body can be made to cooperate, discover what new combinations make good holes in human life. And again, while some of these skills or arts may seem trivial, the specific actions she promotes are just as significant as those she rejects. The verbs explore, discover, and even understand suggest an alternative style of teaching and learning that rejects mastery in favor of a process-oriented pedagogy. Uh, my favorite definition that I found for explore is, quote, to go or to or around an unknown or unfamiliar place in order to learn about it. So there's this element of wandering and physical sensory experience that informs this approach to learning. To discover and explore are words used interchangeably in each other's definition. Yet the definition of discovery also has this self-reflective self aspect, um, at least within the historical usage of the word. So it can mean to disclose or reveal something previously unknown, um, but may also indicate a new or developing interest. Um, and in that sense, 
discovery may apply to discovering regions of the cell that were previously unknown, as well as to observing and mapping external phenomena. Um, so what is a Wolfian pedagogy? There's a lot of great research on Wolfian pedagogy and much of it positions her in opposition to authority. So I'm not breaking new ground here exactly. Um, Beth Regal Doherty asserts that Wolf's pedagogical style, which emerges mainly through her essays is quote, a questioning, conversational and inclusive attitude and a stance that recognizes difference, clarifies position and emphasizes process. Susan Stanford Friedman argues that each of Wolf's texts quote, sets the ground for its own experiments, which it teaches its readers to interpret, end quote. She also asserts that Wolf addresses the common reader who has, quote, none of the trappings of authority, end quote, but is instead able to read the text uh, in a more creative spirit, taking on the role of the text's co-author. Matthew Cheney adds that the polyphony of three guineas has the effect of making us yearn for an authoritative voice to clear things up and give us a packaged meaning, but is it exactly such authority that Wolf subverts? Um, finally, J. Ashley Foster indicates that the type of education Wolf proposes in Three Guineas, with all its emphasis on connection and combination, resembles what Deluc and Guattari identify as a rhizomatic structure, quote, having no center, but rather a network of branches and roots all segments of which are fertile, end quote. Again, all of these scholars agree that Wolf's pedagogical style situates her as decentering or subverting or refusing authority. What is ungrading? Um, sorry, I'm, okay, I was not actually able to locate any scholarships that specifically addresses the practice of grading or assessment with regards to Wolf. Doesn't mean it's not there. I just wasn't able to find anything. So if you know something, please let me know at the end. Um, one of the pioneers of the ungrading movement, Jesse Stommel, quotes John Holt's assertion that grades, quote, seem to me the most authoritarian and dangerous of all the social inventions, um, end quote. In the same article, Stommel also observes that grades quote, too often communicate only a student's ability to follow instructions, end quote. It follows then that a system of grading works best to assess learning in a class where a teacher uses authoritative methods to dictate precisely what students ought to do or know. As I mentioned earlier, Wolf may very well have described this kind of educator as a dictator, literally someone who, quote, dictates to other human beings how they shall live, what they shall do, end quote. Ungrading then is a response to this analysis of the harmfulness and inefficacy of grading. Um, Stommel says, quote, ungrading means raising an eyebrow at grades as a systemic practice, distinct from simply not grading. The word is a present participle, an ongoing process, not a static set of practices. Uh, so it is not an abandoning of teaching responsibility, but rather a focus on feedback alone without labels, which nurtures intrinsic motivation and engages students in learning through reflection. Wolf says in Three Guineas that labels, quote, kill and constrict, end quote. Contemporary teacher scholars have turned to ungrading for many of the same reasons that Wolf laid out in Three Guineas almost a century ago. Susan Blum, for example, points out that, quote, the 20th century rise of a focus um, on assessment stems in large part from the scientific management views of schooling as consisting of a limited number of identical measurable tasks, along with the notion that scarcity and competition are the essence of schooling." End quote. So I don't have enough time to discuss it in depth here. On the most basic level, ungrading resists mastery in favor of assessing learning as a process of discovery for each individual student, uh, which aligns with Wolf's hopes for what a college education ought to be. So why doesn't everyone do it on grading? In Three Guineas, Wolf abandoned her idealistic vision trailing off with ellipses. Quote, not from lack of things to say, but because of the fact that it seems like a dream 
when reality imposes the necessity of earning degrees to obtain appointments and thus earn a living independently. End quote. For Wolf, the opening of colleges and professions to women was not an unequivocal good. Yes, it would allow women to escape the tyranny of their fathers by going out in the world and earning money, which would in turn allow her to express her opinions without fear of retaliation. However, many college instructors and professors live in fear of offending their institutions that they also depend on for financial security. Despite being a quote, full professor, white, neurotypical, cisgender, straight, a native speaker of English, a citizen at a private university with every possible advantage, end quote, Susan Blum admits she was deeply worried about implementing this change in her courses. We have not escaped financial dependence. We have merely transferred that dependence from the private to the public sector. If we did not fear retaliation, why would we have some need to, you know, put some version of views my own on our Twitter profiles. Um, I'd like to suggest that those with the relative comfort and security of tenure may be at risk of being the most hesitant to truly experiment because they have the most to lose. In order to build a career, there is just as much or more bowing to the status quo as there is innovation. And that's what I believe Wolf wanted to warn us about when she entreated us to remain outsiders. Um, so unlike our full-time and tenured colleagues, part-time instructors or adjuncts are often free from scrutiny. Never mind that this is often just neglect. I'm here to argue that we adjuncts should use our exclusion in order to undermine the hierarchical systems of exclusion uh, that is grading. So there's no official oversight of our classes. We don't compile documents for annual review. Yet I argue that the tenuousness of our positions should not make us conform in fear. In fact, it should make us space for us to rebel and experiment. Adjuncts make up about half of all college instructors. And because we teach int introductory courses, we set student expectations. True, we are also expendable and replaceable, but I would say so is the university we teach for. No one's going to really question why we lost our last position. And this is because we don't get fired so much as we are afterthoughts and will be rehired as we're needed. Um, I do wanna take a moment to note that I am a part-time instructor at Nevada State and I actually feel very valued by my colleagues in the English department, <laughs> despite lacking certain resources. Uh, but I know that this is not the case for everyone everywhere. Um, and then just to bring this presentation back around to Wolf, she valued the characteristics that were forged in the crucible of women's oppression. And she labeled these, quote, poverty, chastity, derision, and freedom from unreal loyalties. Wolf says that those who are economically dependent have strong reasons for fear, end quote. And while we may lament the pathetic state of adjunct compensation, it does allow us the freedom from loyalty to that institution. While Kaylee Bogum argues against this, saying that the desire for promotion creates an atmosphere of competition, uh, and silence where risk-taking is discouraged, I counter with the fact that I could make as much money waiting tables. Um, so like, if I get fired, it's who cares? That's kind of where I'm at. I mean, like I care, but also there's this ethical imperative to adopt uh, a more equitable form of assessment. And if I am teaching at a university that doesn't value those things, and wants to fire me, then like, that's not a huge loss is kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, our ambitions should not interfere with our principles. We have no loyalty or obligation to blindly follow traditional grading practices and refusal is demonstrated in three guineas as a strategy that can and should be wielded by outsiders. Daugherty indicated that Wolf, like herself and myself as well, was an insider in many ways, though she, quote, perceived herself as an outsider, end quote, in order to challenge the status quo. I truly believe that Wolf would want us to seize upon that which allows us to free ourselves from the trappings of the institution, which we are also partly inside, and to question to what extent we ought to be loyal to it. Uh, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge that I recently came across an article in the Chronicle that argues against asking historically marginalized instructors to cede authority 
in classrooms where their authority may already be in question, saying that it isn't fair. But every time I read Wolf's text and her imperative to remain outsiders, I can't help but be reminded that we shouldn't want these things the titles, the authority, because they transform us unwittingly into dictators, in the sense Wolf uses the term, who would have students obey us instead of educators who would rather let students choose their own learning adventures. But again, I do want to remain cognizant of the privileged position I inhabit, and I'd like this to be an invitation to debate this issue in Q&A, as well as any other ideas my presentation has introduced. And of course, in the spirit of intellectual humility, if you know of any resources to recommend for further research on this, I am always happy to take recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. And if we could, if everyone could just unmute for a second and show your appreciation for all our presenters um, for sharing their work with us today, that would be great. So. Um, yeah, so we've got, you know, plenty of time for, for Q&A. Um, you can feel free to type your questions into the chat, or if you simply want to ask them, um, I ask that you use the raise your hand function um, on your Zoom room. At the bottom, you should see a little smiley face that says reactions. I saw a lot of us using the clap reactions. It seems like we we're all pretty good on, on the hand raise. Um, uh, just to get us started, not really a question, just uh, again, um, uh, some more words of appreciation.